The election of Olusha Gombasanjo as president of Nigeria in 1999 effectively brought to an end his 16 years of military rule. Nigerians greeted the transition from military to civilian rule with widespread jubilation as they look forward to a new era of stability, peace, and prosperity. Welcome to Standpoint. I am Adimola Lawrence. Nigeria's democratic experience since the independence in 1960 has been the who often uh, resorts to divisive tendencies. And of course, this is one of the talking points we'll be looking at at this episode of Standpoint, where we'll look at the 63 years of independence of Nigeria. October 1st is going to be tomorrow, and Nigeria is going to be celebrating its 60 years of independence from the colonial masters, the British. Joining me to talk about this, uh, of course, in this discussion, is Professor of African History and Political Science, Tony Falola, who is, of course, in the United States. Um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Tony Falola. And uh, along with him is uh, the Professor of uh, Political Science, and, of course, he was a former Deputy Special Representative to the Secretary General for Somalia, uh, talking about... Professor Baba Femi Badejo, who is also a professor of political science. Thank you both for joining me on the show today. Yes, thank you very much, Dimala. Okay, let me start with you, Professor Baba Femi. Um, by tomorrow, which is, of course, October 1st, Nigeria is going to be celebrating its 63rd uh, independence from the colonial masters. Looking at that journey, and how Nigerians, uh, Nigeria have been able to survive the coups, uh, the social political uh, vices that we have also faced. Um, do you think that indeed we have probably come of age or we are on the journey uh, to a true democracy that Nigeria wants? Well, um, I, I will say that uh, we are very, very far from. Uh, a true democracy, and I'm glad you put the word true democracy, because uh, the tendency is for us to emphasize the fact that you have civil rule as democracy. You have elections as democracy. The only time in my own mind when Nigeria could ever have been, or a portion of Nigeria could ever have been said to have been democratic would have been the period in which Obafemi Awolowo led Western Nigeria, in which case you had people who are representing a segment of the country, and they also performed tremendously. For me, I don't go by all these arguments of uh, democracy. Uh, I use the simple, the simplistic Abraham Lincoln uh, government of the people, meaning that it is the people themselves and not some foreign entities that are governing them by the people. Then you are talking about the participation of the people in the democratic experiment. And when you are talking about that, election is just one small part of it. Then for the people, in that case, you are talking about the performance of the government in delivering what I call utmost freedom the purpose of man. So if we have that at all, it was in that brief period that uh, the Awolawo government in Western region of Nigeria provided so much beyond its taking power from the British at the time, beyond the uh, Western region election. And he went into tremendous effort that made the lives of people like myself different. I, I normally joke with people that I would have been a roadside mechanic if I did not democratically um, uh, de uh, deliver. I'm not saying that a roadside mechanic is not contributing to the country, but the fact that I'm talking to you and talking to other people represented um, uh, the uh, Secretary General in a number of places uh, 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 working for the United Nations come out of the what I was planted in that period. Are we going along that line? No. Are we building institutions to take us in that direction? I will, I will divert a little bit to allow my boss to come in and make a joke of the fact that we are only the country where the president can disappear for eight days and nobody is even asking, where is our president? I mean, 
uh, 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 then you are talking about uh, democracy. Uh, uh, we, institutions, building the appropriate institutions for governance, uh, 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 being in a position to, to provide a leadership, leadership that delivers for people. Uh, um, uh, the, those are the kind of things that I would look at in talking about, and if you're asking me, in this, I started from the pre-independence and said that everything worked well, and then it halted. Of course, I'm not saying people have not tried. They have done a number of one step forward, two, three, four steps backward, and then another person comes and tries, and, and then we go in the same uh, uh, problem of leadership deficit, humongous corruption, uh, uh, a lack of infrastructure, you want to talk about electricity, you want to talk about uh, health, you want to talk about even simple uh, uh, sanitation, you want to talk about production of electricity, um, uh, which could ginger uh, development. But yeah, uh, I, uh, my, I, I don't think we should be celebrating anything uh, personally, um, but that's just my own view. Okay, of course, that's your own opinion. As some would have, some also said that, uh, looking at where Nigeria is coming from since 1960, rather, um, there's been some progress. Uh, it's, not, it's not uhuru to say that everything will be just fine as it is. Some also said no election or no democracy is perfect all around the world. But let me bring in uh, Professor Tony Falola, uh, if you can hear me. Professor Tony, can you hear me, sir? Very much so. Okay, so I want us to look at this from this, the aspect of what exactly is the issue with the Nigerian democracy? Is it from the cultural aspect of it? You know, probably when we got independence from the colonial masters in 1960, October 1st precisely, was it a matter of sinking with our cultural, was it simply with our cultural belief? Or why does it seem that we are not getting it right, you know, to have democracy since okay. independence? Thank you very much. And we should not confuse democracy with the system that you use to govern yourself. So you can have democracy in a unitary system, democracy in a federal system, we should bear that in mind. So when Professor Badejo mentioned the whole law period, he was referring to democracy within a regional system so that as this conversation goes on, we can also talk about the system. So, and we can also say, well, we are not under military rule because you do not want to be under military rule. We can see that as an achievement. We can say that where elections are fair and people vote and their votes are counted and the outcome is the people they want in power, that's a very good idea. As in some local governments or as in some states where they did not rig those elections. And we can also say that is democracy as a working project will keep unfolding and hope that four years' time will be better, that the INEC will conduct free and fair election and the civil society will be active. Having said that, these are the issues. We have politicians and Nigerian politicians, when it comes to political calculations, they are one of the very best in the world. You can't beat them. They're very good at that job. But we have no governance. And that is the problem. You, you can have good politicians managing what you call democracy. But it does not mean that those good politicians can deliver governance. Second, whether you rig elections or not, this democracy has been providing leadership. We've always had leaders. They may go to court, as they are doing now. Atiku may be angry, as he has been. But eventually, we've had governors, we have presidents. So there's leadership. But the problem is, we don't have strong institutions. 
So that democracy is making those elections to produce the governors and the chair of local governments and presidents, but it's not empowering those institutions. For instance, we do not have powerful institutions of transparency, and we do not have powerful institutions of accountability. We have the EFCC anti-corruption agency, but those are not stopping people from not being corrupt. That's the second problem. Then we have the third problem, which Professor Badejo has highlighted efficiently, democracy without dividends. So because the object of democracy, is end result is to produce dividends in good governance. When, when there was a huge debate and many people met in Egypt, and they asked us to define democracy in the African context, we were very clear that we cannot define democracy outside of development that your citizens, will, they, they want you to eliminate poverty. They want you to give them jobs. They want, them, they want you to give them hospitals. So if that democracy does not produce those dividends, you lose them. You lose them. It, it simply becomes a form of government that does not deliver. And then one final point, we have political parties. Or well, these political parties exist to contest elections. They exist to solve conflicts among themselves. They are not different from one another. And the agenda of development is not core to their mission. So we have political parties, but what do they do? No development platform. So as the country moves forward, we hope that this democracy will produce transparency, the democracy will produce accountability, the democracy will produce political parties whose agenda is to be about development, and the democracy will produce strong institutions. Thank you for that brilliant question. Okay, so I, I still want to stay with you, Prof. You know, when you said that uh, trying to define democracy in the African context, some have said, you know, what is applicable, for example, uh, to the citizens of the United States might not be applicable to the realities of what we are facing here back in Nigeria, for example. So don't you think that we need to fashion out a way that things that will please us as Nigerians, that is what we should lay down? And I agree with you totally that democracy is like Christianity, like Islam like anything that you borrow from abroad, you have to domesticate it. You have to translate it into what will work for you. You have to adapt it. For instance, democracy does not mean I'm not going to respect Professor Badi Joy is older than me. And democracy does not mean I won't respect you who is younger than me. Democracy does not mean that I will not respect poor people on the streets. So th those things can be, can be uh, domesticated. But at the same time, democracy must apply to our own core projects. So the US does no longer deals in small issues, electricity, water supply. They don't deal in those small issues anymore, garbage collection. But in our own form of democracy, we still have to deal with the basic issues. How can people have jobs? How can we clean the streets? Democracy, if you don't convince your citizen that their life is going to improve, they are not going to be committed to that democracy themselves. And they've demonstrated it in, in stomach infrastructure. Give me money, let me vote for you. Give me bread and rice, let me vote for you. Why? Because once you've won the election, I will not see you again. Our people are extremely intelligent. They're extremely smart. They know what they want. 
And what they want is to elevate their standard of living. There is no question. Anybody you see on the streets will tell you the purpose of a good government is to improve my life. And that is where we have to do the fix and the fixes in our democracy. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me come to you, uh, Professor Baba Femi. You know, I want us to backtrack a bit and going back to, you know, when you mentioned uh, Chief Obafemi Awolowo uh, during his days as the Premier of the Western Region, and you have the likes of um, uh, Amadou Bello and, of course, Namdi Azikwe and all of them. But I, I just want to also backtrack a bit in terms of the things that happened between that era, where you have these persons lay down what the tenet should be or what should be obtainable in our own settings back here at home after moving from the colonial era. Do you think that we have actually maintained those tenets or we are deviating from it? Just to move further in my question, do you also think that the coups that have happened in Nigeria also you know, truncates the development or the progressive nature of how democracy should be should 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 go in Nigeria. Well, um, it's a it's a very good question you have posed. I mean, two uh, double barrel questions that you have posed. Um, there is no doubt that a lot of effort when you examine the history, uh, uh, which Professor. Palola is a very great expert uh, 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 of that period. Uh, you, you're talking about uh, just before independence and then through to uh, immediately after independence. They indeed, in their respective regions, were setting up some yardstick, some criteria to be able to achieve development. I will only be suggesting that Obafemi Awolowo had strides, he had overprepared for governance, and he delivered in that respect. But there are other problems that must be looked at. The political parties of the period had some ideological orientation that we have failed in that respect. Uh, but I am not one of those that want to put everything at the doorstep of the military. Yes, the military period was problematic, but how did we get into the military period? It was because of the failure of the civilians of the period and uh, the high-handedness, and you now found a group of people that gave the impression that they were going to change the whole order and allow the uh, civil rule to continue. In that respect, um, the, 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 there was a, a, a clear failure. But don't forget, because we tend to say 1999, 1999, then Pro, a lot Pro, of pressures Pro, all over the Yes. I, I, just, I, I want to just interject there and say that, you know, when you say you don't want to probably put everything into uh, the blame on the military, um, the baby was just born like six years. I'm talking about... Nigeria just gave in, gained independence in 1960, and the first coup happened in 1966. So the baby was just, it's just trying to walk and trying to get his, gain, gain his stamina. And all of a sudden, uh, a coup happened. How do you explain that you know, without putting that on, 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 the, um, on, on the military? And to also go further, you, because you were initially saying that the likes of Obafemi Aolowo and all of them. So are you also saying their programs were not intended with the realities of what is happening to the Nigerian people at the time? Well, uh, 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 Demola, it, what, what you're posting is, is uh, very interesting. Um, uh, by, uh, the, uh, is it 51? Uh, we were already having um, uh, self-government. Uh, uh, the free compulsory free primary education in Western Nigeria was already 
in, in place uh, by 1955. All these, some of these carried on even to the period under the military. But the hour that we were talking about, where was he when the coup took place? Awo had been jailed on what he and his supporters says were trumped off charges that was meant to, um, uh, that ended up, let me not say meant to, that ended up disrupting the same Western region we were talking about, where progress was being made. The military didn't do that, okay? So, so if we are talking about, uh, I'm not saying don't blame the military, but we find it so easy to always want to put all the problems uh, elsewhere. If we're not putting it on the foreigners, we are putting it on the military. But look at, we now had 79, 79 uh, uh, the, the, the civilian regime came in. And what happened? It became impossible. The rigging of the elections of 1983 made me decide I will never go to any voting poll uh, again since 1983. What all of a sudden, uh, of Onagoro started calling landslide uh, um, uh, on, on, on NTA. Of course, prepared the whole environment in which Buhari Diagbon came back. And then we have had the uh, 1999 experience and peers and people are counting coups are no longer in fashion, except now that it is coming back. But the problem of performance remains. So if we are having leadership deficits on in our country, largely on our continent, because look at Asia, compare us with Asia and other places. But if we are having leadership deficit, I'm saying we should not, we should engage with these politicians to make them see their failure as accounting for some of those interruptions, which none of us is saying is desirable, but that uh, uh, the, the, this, I mean, look at the greed, the greed that is taking place in the last uh, uh, eight to nine years, uh, uh, or if you like, stretch it to 1999, then you tell me we, we, we are totally going towards bankruptcy, 95% okay. uh, 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 being used to service debts, and the money is sitting in different accounts of different people, and we are not bold enough to say that we need to re-engage collect what people have stolen to make life overall diff diff different from our people. Okay. But we are dancing around. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Um, Prof, I, I was, I'll say come back to you. I, I just want, I want Professor Toyin to also, you know, say something about this. And, and because I also know that this is your area of specialization, you like to talk about the fact that coups are not great for, 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 any, for, any, uh, for any country. But lo look at you know, if you have to measure the Nigeria's journey to democracy and how things have been truncated over time, you would start from, like I mentioned to him, the January uh, 1966 coup, the counter coup, of course, which happened in July. And you look at the coup brought, that brought, that also, you know, which also, that coup provided, uh, brought in um, Agui Rosi. Then the other one that came in, of course, brought in Yakubu Gowon. You look at all those schools, which also brought in uh, former uh, military head of state, talking about um, General Muhammad Buhari, then going into Babangida, then going into uh, Sonia Bacha. You don't think that all of those things over time also draws back in actually getting the desired result that we have. To also now point out, the second leg of my question is that do you think that Nigeria has really, really, indeed recovered? Or is there a handshake over the Niger that has been settled between that 1967 to 1970? Have we really done, done that? Thank you for that loaded question. And I will start by saying that all the variables, factors, that produced the Nigerian Civil War, 67 to 70, remain with us. In other words, the wars, the causes have not been resolved. Second, the anger that that war generated 
remains with us. And you see it in Tanu, Ipob, Biafra. And it's very unusual to fight a war of that magnitude and nature without bringing resolution. The Igbo people are angry. This is a fact. They are angry. And part of the anger is based on the very fact that those wars, the challenges, and what led to them have not been fully resolved. But they are not the only angry people. The minorities in the North are very angry, especially in the Middle Belt. Bear in mind that but for the coup, it was difficult for Middle Belters to have come to power. When you mention Gowon and many of these people, it was the coup that gave them a chance. And bear in mind, but for the way of Basenjo cleverly manipulated the PDP and the German in person of Jonathan Goodluck, will I find it difficult to come to power? Those issues are still there. And remember, these issues dated to the, to the 1950s. How do you balance the interest of the larger group with those of the smaller ethnic groups? We have not been able to resolve that. Suppose I were an Igede from Benue State. What is my chance of becoming the president of Nigeria or even becoming the governor of Benue State? My chances are very small. So we have over half the population coming from small ethnicities who don't even stand a chance of becoming the president of their own country. That is not good. That is not good. Second, we have unresolved issues around over-centralization. The coup brought that centralized federal system. And we are yet to break away from that. When you hear about the Dua Republic, when people talk about restructuring, when people talk about they are not being happy with the arrangement. It is all about the power that has been given to the federal government in Abuja. And it was the coup that brought that over centralization to the extent now that our brothers and sisters in the North do not join in that restructuring project. Point number four, how the federal system in managing its revenues is extremely dysfunctional. The tiny corner of the country that we call the Delta virtually fills the entire country. So we have in, in this union, in this polygamous union, many wives very angry with their one husband. We have states in the union that are not contributing sufficiently to the federal wallet. They're not contributing, but they're deriving maximum benefit from where? From Niger Delta. Because of the way the fiscal federalism is arranged, money comes from Niger Delta. The bulk of the other money comes from Lagos Port Authority, and we have taxes collected in the South. That is one of the reasons in 1914 that led to the amalgamation use the proceeds of the customs in Lagos to finance the North and other parts. We have not been able to manage that fiscal federalism and it keeps producing anger and anger and anger. Lagos state is richer than Ghana. Lagos state is richer than many African countries, but it's not the only one benefiting from its resources. If Niger Delta were to be in the US in the federal system, it would be the richest state, set of states in the country. And if you calculate it very well, it will be one of the largest economies in the world. But other units in the federal system 
that pans on that revenue. That dated back to this military. And finally, finally, issues of religious identities remain in which politicians in all these regions take religiosity and just convert it to, to, to power and domination such that even in producing ambassadors, producing ministers, producing heads of parastatus from the crisis that you pointed, you, you alluded to in the 60s, they continue. How many Muslims are ministers? How many Christians are ministers? How many Muslims are vice chancellors? And things keep degenerating as we revive this uh, older identity. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, it's been an interesting one. We'll go on a break. When we come back, we're still looking at the journey of Nigeria to democracy. Okay, welcome back. This is Standpoint, and we're looking at the Nigeria's journey to democracy since in the last 63 years of independence after Nigeria got independence from the colonial era. And I've been talking to a uh, professor of political science, Baba Femi, uh, Baba, of course, Baba Femi, uh, Badejo, who is, of course, a special representative to the uh, Secretary General for Somalia, a deputy representative on the United Nations, and, of course, African um, hist historian and a political scientist talking about Tony Falola, the boats being x raying the journey of Nigeria democracy from 1960 up until now. But we'll go straight into the 1990. Now, when Nigeria, of course, um, after that particular election in 1993, uh, which produced uh, MK Abiola, but never became the president. And in 1998, another election, of course, was conducted. By 1999, uh, Olusegun Basunjo became the first uh, president, of course, in the post uh, in the post military era to become the president of Nigeria. And talking about that, uh, so many issues have come up as Nigeria really, really enjoyed the dividends of democracy from that time. 24 years, uh, some have said that uh, Nigeria is not moving. Some have said we're crawling. Some have said um, we are taking a baby step. Some have even said that we are actually on the right step, going the way it should go. I'm going to ask you first, uh, Professor, Professor Twain, looking at this from 1999, 24 years now, um, do you think that we have actually, you know, gained that momentum? And if we have not, what are the things that we need to begin to do? Um, somebody who is 24, year of, 24 years of age, of course, probably in this part of the world, would say would have gotten married, would have started a family. So what do we do? What, how do we get away from this quagmire that some persons have said we are in? Passenger was a military man who had governed before. Fast forward, Buhari was a military man. Of this period, you are talking about 16 years. You are looking at the continuation of a military ethos of governance. Obasanjo demonstrated instances of governing as if he was a general, even recently. In talking to Yoruba Oba, he was speaking to them as a general, stand up, get down. That, that's a way of thinking. And you could see in the management of his affairs as a president, he was behaving as if the barrack was still part of a so rock. So let us, let us bear that in mind. On, on the plus side, remember, Remember that the country in 1960 was around 50 million. Remember today is 200 million. Second, the capacity to feed that population, we must commend the people we do not talk about. We don't talk about the women selling tomatoes on the streets. We never show gratitude to the farmers. Remember, Forget the elite who eat their, their noodles. 
and their bread, that many people actually survive on locally produced food. In Ghana today, there is scarcity of onion because they close borders with Niger. Remember that the basic food for survivor in Nigeria, many of it, especially carbohydrate, come from the country. We have to pay attention to that. Remember how many universities we had in 1960. Now we have over 200. So to answer your question very well, we have to balance the pluses and the minuses and the contradictions. We've grown a massive population. That demography is a huge advantage, but we have not been able to know what to do with that human capacity. And human capacity is the best thing that God himself can give to any country. What then do we do with that? Remember the contradiction that our people were very religious. Near your studio in Lagos, when you step out, count the number of churches, count the number of mosques. Our people are very religious. They talk in terms of ethics and morality, but we are very deficient and we have values that promote corruption. Remember that we are one of the most youthful population in the world. What people pray, what we have, Japan is praying to have, Japan is praying to have that demographic ratio that Nigeria has. Sweden is praying to have that demographic ratio. Many countries are praying to have that demographic ratio that we have in Nigeria. But what do we do with it? We don't do good things with it. What can we do in moving forward? We have to reduce the cost of governance. It is too expensive. What, uh, what, do we, what are we doing with 36 commissioners of works, with one federal commissioner of work? What are we doing with 36 commissioners of everything? What are we doing with 48 ministers? What are we doing with that number of senators? What are we doing with those numbers of House of Representatives and the emoluments and the salary? We have to reduce the cost of governance. Of the total revenues that Nigerians collect, in some years, we spend over 80% of those revenues on bureaucracy, on, on the cost of governance. We, it's not going to work. Call that system anything. Even call it military rule, call it democracy. You cannot spend 80% of resources outside the basic principle of governance. Okay. Second, uh, second, we have to recapital, recapitalize the poor. The poor are doing so badly. Many of us who went to school were not sent to school by rich parents. We were sent to school by poor parents. How do we empower those poor parents? And final point, because you want to stop me, we have to transfer power back to communities. We've taken too much power from communities and we have to figure out in this democratic arrangement, how to reallocate power back to those communities. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I want to be very sure that I heard you right when you said that um, the resources, we don't have enough money. Um, so I want, to, and the resources are not enough, but I want to be very sure. But if, I just wanted to be very sure, is that what you meant, that there's no yes, enough yes, money? Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. You see, because, because politicians are very corrupt, we tend to assume that the country is rich. Okay. I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted yes, to, yes, yes. yeah, I just wanted so to know that. We do not have enough resources to transform the lives of 200 million people oh, very rapidly. Okay, sir. Okay, so, yeah. Prof, Prof, uh, Professor Baba Femi, I, I want to, do you agree with what Professor Toyin said in, by saying that Nigeria does not have enough money, you know, to cater for its citizens? That is the first million people. Yeah. 
that, that's yes, the first uh, leg of my question. Know. Hold on, sir. That's the first leg of my And, you know, he also mentioned the fact that we have grown in numbers. Uh, so what we were in 19, for example, if we are talking in the context of 24 years, what we were in 1999 is not what we, we, we are presently in 2023. So how do you think government needs to be proactive in looking at policies that will, you know, give way to Nigerians and the welfare of Nigerians in years to come. So they have to plan. What are the policies do you think that we need to look at to plan for the nation Nigeria? Uh, those are the two questions I want to ask you. Well, um, uh, on, the, on the main question, which is coming from what Professor Falola said, Professor Falola is correct to some extent. He is looking at the quantum of money we have today and that quantum of money being used by 200 million people. It is peanuts because what we are talking about uh, is less than some of the, uh, some, some, some American companies. Okay, uh, let's not go into uh, states in the United States and uh, what uh, California is worth. But for me, the most important resource that we have is that 200 million people. The issue which he also mentioned is how do we transform that 200 million people into being able to do wonders? Now, in my own lifetime, Deng Xiaoping, you will not, you may not know who he is, built on Mao Zedong's efforts in China. And you're talking about a population that were, that that uh, at that time when uh, uh, Deng started would be I don't know the exact figure but would be like over 800 million people for sure and now today they went over to the 1.4 and are trying to build it to to bring it back realistically and they've been able to lift so many people out of poverty how did they do that I just told you. Deng Xiaoping started from about 1978 to invest in the Chinese people, to curb corruption amongst Chinese people, build leadership among the Chinese people, which leadership addressed community levels that uh, Professor Falola was talking about. And you had different levels of production taking place in China. And the totality of it is what we are now seeing today, that the Chinese have been able to build so much with respect to resources. And it's not the Chinese alone. The Indians are doing the same thing. A number of other Asian countries, um, uh, take Malaysia, Mahatma, uh, Mahathir Mohammed's uh, uh, effort in Malaysia, when we were busy uh, fighting ourselves, uh, stealing money, and even if those monies were being stolen and were being invested in productive capacities, taking people off the road. Look at how many people are busy driving Kekenape uh, 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 all over the place. If, if, if people had the vision that we are associating with them and they had made massive transport arrangements and whatever, those people can go into producing several other things, even if it is onion we are talking about, but no country has been able to do it without industrialization. Look at what became, what, what has become of, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, Ajaokuta. <clears throat> it never got off the ground. If we got all those things running, if we have the infrastructure that links several places, then we will be talking about production that will then have resources coming in from selling those things after we have taken care of our own needs, selling of it to the rest of Africa, to the rest of the world. And that's why I'm saying that the most important resource is that of human capacity that we have. It is the fact that we allow them to remain underemployed 
because our leadership are not focused in that direction. Our leadership are sitting down in the National Assembly and just pocketing money and sharing as they like. And as they share, they take it, they take the money into Europe or of late, they buy dollars, suck up the dollars out of the market. And it's not possible for those who are producing to have enough dollars because these people are storing dollars in their water tanks uh, on, uh, are no longer Naira because it's becoming too bulky and, and whatever. We can never get anywhere with all that. I have spoken about industrialization. There is no way that if we don't address the issue of technology and adding to the question of uh, 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 steel and all the rest of it and manufacturing is the AI that people are leapfrogging on. Is the, the, that the, the artificial intelligence, the in, uh, 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 ICT that people are doing that are, they are investing in, I am happy that some of the positive aspects of our 63 years are some young Nigerians who are doing some of these things successfully, but not at the scale of a purposeful visionary leadership that says we are going to produce for the world. Look at what Indians have done. You enter into any of the uh, major companies in ICT, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, the this, the that, and all the rest of it, they are, the Indians are producing the CEOs of these entities for the rest of the world. What are we doing? Why, why are we not building this youth bulge that we have into some of them producing our food? And Prof is right that especially with respect to um, uh, uh, carbohydrate and uh, protein to some extent, uh, those who are uh, fish farming, uh, uh, aquaculture, uh, and all the rest of it, and, uh, the, the poultry that they are doing is running into crisis because of not enough uh, um, uh, maize and all, all other ingredients that are necessary. What are we doing as a government to make all this uh, uh, happen? You, it, it, simple planting of paper pulps in order to not import 5 billion of paper into the country annually, but to be selling to other portions of the, of the continent. We, we, we lack leadership. We okay. lack leadership. Okay. Leadership yeah. deficit is a major portion of that problem. Okay. Uh, uh, Demola, I will leave you alone. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, Prof. You know, while we round up the show, there's a lot to talk about. Um, but, but while we round up the show, jo in just 30 seconds for, for, for both of you, the, one of the issues that I also want us to look at is the issue of religion and tribalism how entrenched it has been in our democracy and the journey to uh, our democracy. How do you think that we need to deal with this in, uh, you know, in substituting it for competency and capability? Just in 30 seconds. I'll start with you, uh, Professor, Professor Baba Femi. In just in 30 seconds, sir. In 30 seconds, uh, it's unfortunate that it even worsened with the last election. Because at a point in my younger days, we were, we were thinking that uh, um, uh, religious, uh, uh, religious focus and uh, ethnicity focus, when people like uh, uh, Okudi Banoli published his uh, politicization of ethnicity, can be addressed and change those things around. But it is worsening. What can we do about it? We need to confront these problems we need to look at why are we killing ourselves, destroy our country over Abrahamic religions? What okay. has happened to our own? That's a different level of, uh, because when, when Prof spoke about uh, the Yoruba Obas, the Yoruba Obas said that they are back in Yorisha, but they don't, they, they don't want to have anything to do with that Yorisha. They are dealing with the, uh, uh, the Abrahamic religions, and then they expect to have the same respect. Uh, but okay, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tall order question that yes, we, we, we confront it by having a leadership with the vision that here is a single country, look at the injustices of the, to, to the different parts and look into some of the things that we have okay. even put in place over, uh, over time. All right. Okay, sir. So, I, I mean, we, our time is fast spent, but let me just give you, uh, Professor Professor Falola, just the last 30, minutes, 30, 30 seconds. What do you think so, we need to do? 
it will terms. reduce it will reduce poverty some of these issues will reduce okay it will increase the number of our middle class okay that will shift their focus to career issues and finally if we rethink our education system at all levels, civic education, we can focus on people who are under the age of 20 and begin to build a new generation of new Nigerians. We need new Nigerians to manage the Nigerian of the future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. It's been an interesting conversation here on Standpoints, what we're extra, the Nigerian uh, journey to democracy since 1960 and of course it's been a wonderful one to have both professor uh tony falola a professor of african history and of course a political science and um, professor baba femi barijo a professor of political science and a special deputy member to uh, somalia uh, there thank you very much for both joining the show today